Yeah, we love Tosi and Susan, two of our great leaders, pastors, servants here at church. What did Tosi say? There was the honeymoon stage, and then it got real hard. And sometimes the honeymoon stage lasts for about one day. Sometimes we stretch it out a bit, but we all come to a place in every relationship where we realize it's not easy. It doesn't just happen because of the romance. It doesn't just happen because of the flowers or the dress. It takes work. So that's what we've been talking about, how to have lasting relationships, fun, fulfilling relationships, godly relationships as a couple, but in every part of life as well, because many of our church family are single, and uh, we've been through divorces and been through different issues. So we're trying to deal with all of the things that all of our church family uh, is living in today. And we've been getting lots of questions, and you can send in questions. The number will be on the screen, and of course, they're anonymous. Uh, if you want me to shout out your husband's name, you can go ahead and include it. I'd be happy to help you out. Uh, a, few, a few fun questions. We're trying to answer them through our teaching, so we're getting to all of them as we go through, but I'll bring up a couple today. This, this one says, this message is coming from a wife wondering how to not be a slave to anger and replace it with genuine love and care. Okay, step one, that's a great question. Right, you are aware, you, you recognize. I'm letting anger have too big a place in my life. How do I focus on love and care? That's step one. And so you're on your way. That's a great start. Then we've been teaching other things on how to refocus our attention. Today I'm gonna talk about how do we let go of the anger or unforgiveness or bitterness or even memories you might not be able to lose memories, but you can replace memories so they are not at the forefront of your mind. Yeah. So we'll keep talking about that one. Here's another question. How do, how, how do we or what do we do when our spouse is jealous or envious? How can we continue in this mistrust? Okay, a lot of our questions basically say something like this. How do I get my spouse to change? How do I get my spouse to pray more? How do I get my spouse to read their Bible more? How do I get my spouse to worship in church? How do I get my spouse to be more happy? A lot of how do I get my spouse to change questions. Simple answer, you can't. Next question. Okay, expanded answer. You can't. A human problem is thinking that if the other human would change, I would have no problems, right? If you change, I'll be happy. If you change, I'll be better. It's not true. It's not true. What if your spouse was just gone? Let's just imagine that. The one you want, pray more, worship more, sing more, be happy. One of the questions, how do I get my spouse to let, them, let me tickle them? <laughs> I'm assuming that's kind of a joke. But hey, you know, I would say let your wife tickle you. Who knows where it might lead? <laughs> I mean, if that's all it takes, bro, that's easy. But the, there's a human problem that we all have, and that is if someone else changes, particularly my spouse, or if my boss changes, if my, if my city changes, if my government changes, if the world changes, waiting on the world to change, then I'll be happy. It's not true. It's not true. What if your spouse was just gone? They left. Tomorrow they left. You no longer have to worry about them praying more, singing more, tickling more. They're gone. It's over. Are you going to be happy? You're going to be prospering? You're going to be healthy? Probably not. You'll find someone else and you'll have something else you want them to change. So you get into a habit of waiting on the world to change rather than saying, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to love God. I'm going to be my best that I can be for God. 
and then I'm going to just radiate that out. I'm going to let that flow out of me. Jesus said, out of your belly flows rivers of living water. That doesn't mean that those around you will change, but I'll, I'll tell you this, you have a better chance of causing change when you forget about it than you do when you're trying to get other people to change. Right? So you'll have a better chance. Well, lots of fun questions. Um, dealing with different beliefs. Catholic versus Christian. How do we deal with different beliefs in marriage? Now, in that particular question, Catholic and Christian beliefs are pretty much the same. It's a few little glitches, like the Pope. <laughs> but typically, 80% of Catholic beliefs are biblical. They added a few things in for fundraising purposes. No, I'm not kidding. But here's the answer. Just have the attitude, we go to the Bible. Let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the Word. We're not going to the Book of Mormon. We're not going to the teachings of whoever. We're going to the Bible, and we're going to follow that. And if you can live that way, hopefully your spouse will agree with that, and you will find the highest level of truth. Every group, every religion, everything has some good things, but the Bible is the ultimate truth. <laughs> Amen. The world says, well, it's my truth. I, I'm, I'm finding my truth. There's no such thing as your truth. You tripping. You smoking too much pot. There is the truth, and then there's your trip. There's not your truth or my truth. I'm finding my truth. No. We create these funny phrases to make ourselves feel good with our own compromise and our own issues. The fact is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. So no one is finding their own truth. We're all seeking after his truth. Right? Okay, what else did I find in here? I was married before, now divorced. What does the Bible say about divorce? Okay, number one issue about divorce, God forgives. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Divorce does not make you a second-class Christian. Wendy and I struggled in our first church before we were pastors because all the people we were bringing to church, most of them were in rehab and had gone through all the crises in life, and they couldn't be a member, and they couldn't serve, and they couldn't get on the dream team because of their past. And I said to the pastor, I thought God forgives. I thought they were new creations in Christ. I thought the Lord loves us and his grace covers us. And the pastor said, yes, but we don't want everybody in church to get a divorce, so we make it that, you know, you, you can't be a member if you've been divorced. In some churches, like the Catholic Church, that if you're divorced, you can't take communion. Okay, that's religion. That's man's judgment, man's control, trying to trying to make people do the right thing by somehow manipulating them? No. God forgives. God knows your pain as much or more than you know your pain. So now the thing is, are you getting better? What you don't want to do, go through divorce, find someone else, another divorce, find someone else, and you just are cycling through the same problems and the same struggles. Let's get healed. Let's get renewed. Let's be transformed by the renewing of our mind so we can find God's perfect will. Many of you listen to preachers on television. I can share their names with you. You come up to me after church. I love Brother So. Oh, I love the teaching of Pastor So. Oh, I love Brother So and So. And you don't know they've been divorced. If you did, you might think, well, God can't really use them. Obviously, he is. You love him. <laughs> not knowing what they've been through, right? So divorce is not the unpardonable sin. The key with divorce is own your part and get better so that your future will be blessed. Amen? Okay, well, we'll keep looking at 
questions. I want to talk to you about this today, emotional baggage. Subconscious, sometimes we're not even aware of it, emotional baggage. I mean things like unforgiveness. That's an emotional baggage that we carry through life. Unforgiveness is tragic. Unfaithfulness, that brings lots of guilt, anger, pain, frustration. Anger is another one. Just being upset, just being frustrated, just being angry about my life or others in my life. Fear, emotional baggage. Fear is heavy. How many times did God say in the Bible, fear not? About 365 times, one for every day of the year. Worry, self-centeredness, right? We love this idea of self in this generation. We want more self-care. Today is a self-care day. For some people, every day is self-care. It's always about their self. I love myself. I'm trying to feel better about myself. I'm just trying to give myself a hug. I need to go to the spa, take care of myself. You know, your self is killing you. Really? Self-centeredness is sucking you dry. Wendy told you this morning, when you give, it's given unto you. When you forget about yourself, you actually bless yourself. One day I said to Julius, my spiritual father, when I was a brand new Christian, I said, Julius, I've been thinking about myself, and he said, stop right there. The more you think about yourself, the more self-centered you are, the greater pain emotional baggage that you carry. Now, we believe in counseling and therapy and getting help, but don't make it a lifestyle. Don't make it this self-care lifestyle. I've been in counseling for 30 years. Are you better? <laughs> no, but I married my counselor. <laughs> what? It's like the guy who was always traveling and sent a letter to his wife every day, so the wife married the postman. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, anything against anyone, but pastor, you don't know what they did. Anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, Neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. What you may not know is the more anger, frustration, unforgiveness you carry, the, the more emotional baggage you carry, the more hindrance you're putting between you and God. You think you're just mad at your spouse or your family or your coworkers or whatever. You're actually stopping your relationship with God. And many people wonder, how come I don't feel the Lord? How come I don't see God answering my prayer? How come I don't see God working in my life like other people do? It's because of all your emotional baggage. You've cut off your connection with God because of all the emotional baggage that you have toward others. you got to be right this way so you can stay right this way. The cross keeps you going this way and this way. It's both people and your Father in heaven. It's horizontal and vertical that you want to stay healthy. Look in, well here, I'm going to read Mark 11 in the Amplified Bible. If you have anything against anyone, here's the Amplified. Forgive him or her. Let it drop. Leave it. Let it go. Now, God can't tell you to do something that it's impossible for you to do, right? He can only tell you what he knows you can handle. He said, let it go. Well, I can't. I can't take it anymore. This is eating me up. It's consuming. I think about it all the time. Stop. Let it go. I can't do that. You can if you will. You can if you will. You may have created such a lifestyle of thinking about your hurts, thinking about your feelings, thinking about what they said, remembering what happened, 
Facebooking about it, sharing it, talking about it, journaling. I'm journaling. I'm journaling my pain. I'm journaling my problem. Why would you write it down? I want to remember. It's hard to let it go when you've spent so much time trying to hang on to it. Spend more time hanging on to the Word, hanging on to the Lord, hanging on to your faith, hanging on to love, hanging on to forgiveness. Don't focus on all the things that God said. Let it go. And the fact that God said to let it go means you can. You can if you will. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Since we're surrounded by a cloud of great witnesses, people who've gone on before us, people who've sacrificed for us, people who've led the way for us. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You cannot run your race with Jesus and carry the weight of the world. You can't live the life God's called you to live and carry all the emotional baggage of your past. You have to let it go. Release the weight and the sin, right? But he's not only talking about sin. We know our drunkenness. We know our our, our abuse. We know those things that are sin, But he also said the weights, just the burdens, just the emotions that we carry around. He said, let it go. Release the weight. Let the weight drop so you can run with Jesus. How much life are you missing because you are so emotionally weighted down? How much prosperity are you missing Because emotionally you carry such baggage. How much joy are you missing? Because you're carrying the weight of your past. So you've got to decide. I'm going to run this race and I'm not going to carry the weight. I'm going to lay aside the weight and the sin which would stop me from running for Christ. You know, one of the things that happens in our culture I think it started in the baby boom generation. It's probably even more so now <clears throat> in this current generation. Is when we're young, we start practicing the breakup. We just get into a lifestyle of the breakup. Someone was talking to me the other day about their, their son and their daughter's boyfriend and girlfriend. And they're eight and 10 years old. And mom and dad are kind of, you know, it's innocent, it's cute. They have a boyfriend at school, at church. They have a boyfriend. They have a day, uh, a daycare. They have a girlfriend. And, and, and there's this thing that is so cute. And they kind of take pictures together. And they play together. They do things together. But we all know it's short term. We all know this is maybe going to last till Friday. <laughs> right? And then it's over. And then you're on to the next boyfriend. And the next girlfriend. Or maybe schedules change, schools change, people move. Okay, got a new boyfriend, new girlfriend. You start creating a lifestyle of the breakup. When you get to be 13 or 14, it starts to become a little more serious because other kids get involved. And you're you're sending notes or you're texting. You're writing to your girlfriend, I think I like Bobby. You think he likes me? Oh, yeah, I'm sure Bobby likes you. Let me check. I'll find out. Yep, Bobby likes you. Are you with me? So that's going to last, you know, a couple days, a month at most. And then it's going to be Billy. On to the next relationship, we practice the breakup. He broke up with me through a text. He didn't have the guts to come and talk to me. He ain't never talked to you. This relationship was all in your head. He liked me. I like him. Okay, we're in love. No, you're not. You tripping. But you're practicing the breakup. Now, you get to be 16, 17. It gets a little more serious. Now, it gets a little physical. Now, you're kissing. He's a good kisser. Is he a good kisser? Oh, yeah, he's a good kisser. 
And in the public schools, in the worldly schools, you're sending pictures. You're sexting. There wasn't no sexting when I was a kid. Thank the Lord, I'd have been stone crazy. <laughs> but in our world, this is normal. I haven't had sex, but I've done a lot of sexting. And I'm dreaming, I'm tripping, I'm imagining. And I got a boyfriend, I got a girlfriend. And then we start talking about all the various components of sexual identity. But we're moving through these relationships. They're all short-term relationships. A week, a month, two months. I remember the time the girl wanted me to be her boyfriend. And she asked me, do you like me? I said, oh, yeah, I like you. And then she said, good. And then I found out later, she said to her girlfriends, I can get Casey to like me. I'll show you. And so that was all it was about, just a little bet, a little trip going with the girlfriends. So I, I'm still heartbroken about it. I'm still struggling. I can tell you her name right now. I hate all girls by this name. It hurts deep. It hurts. Right? So we all have these memories and these issues we've been through. And then you get to be 20 and 30, maybe you get pregnant. If you're the guy, you have some kids that never leave your mind. You say, I ain't got time for them kids. Them kids are with you the rest of your life, whether you ever admit it or not. So if you don't do with it in a godly way, it becomes painful. If you don't do the godly thing, it becomes a weight. And then maybe a divorce but always short-term relationships. And the problem is you don't realize you've created a habit. If you live together, it's because you're not ready for a lifetime commitment. So again, that subconscious short-term relationship. Maybe it's longer than when I was 12, but it's still not a lifetime commitment. I'm just moving on to the next relationship. This becomes a lifestyle for many people. So marriage is hard because you're struggling subconsciously with the breakup. You've already had 30 breakups by the time you got married. You're good at the breakup. You've not been good at lasting commitment. You don't even get it. Now, statistics show us that living together pretty much guarantees a relationship will not work. There are a few people that break the rule, live together, get married, stay together. Majority, the vast majority, it's a short-term relationship. Living together is not preparation for long-term marriage. Living together is preparation for another breakup. So you have to renew your mind. You have to decide, I'm going to stop carrying the baggage of my past. I'm going to start walking with Jesus. I'm going to do it God's way. I'm not going to do it the way the world does it. I'm not going to do it the way I've always done it. I'm going to do it God's way, and I'm going to win in life. Come on, somebody. Give me an amen right there. So everybody has baggage, right? We're all carrying those relationships. How many boyfriends did you have? when you were a teenager? How many girlfriends did you have? Anybody want to shout out some numbers? A few? You don't want to say out loud. It's okay. You're in church. I get it. We start piling up baggage. You know, mom and dad got divorced. That's a lot of baggage for a kid. People say, oh, the kids are fine. No, we were not fine. I was 17 when my parents got divorced, and then, and then my parents got remarried. That was almost worse than the divorce. I don't mean that in a, in a sarcastic way. It was tragic going through your own parents' marriage. And you're trying to be happy for them because you love your mom and your dad, but you're at their wedding, and you're thinking, this spouse is worse than the last one. Baggage. We just start piling it on. By the time we get old enough to get married and have our own kids, we got so many issues, we don't even remember them all. We got so many hurts and things we've been through, we can't even remember them. 
Somebody said to me the other day, Pastor, don't you think people have to confess their sin before they can get saved? And I said, no. Who can remember all their sin? <laughs> the Bible doesn't say confess your sin and get saved. It said confess Jesus. Confess Jesus and you will be saved. Now, you have to leave your sin behind, but I can't remember most of my sins. I had several months I can't remember. What do you suppose I did in those months? Sin. I'm piling up baggage. I got stuff going on. Some of you look like this if we could see into the emotional realm. You come into church, you look good in church, by the way, y'all look good. But if we could see into your emotions, this is what you look like. This is husband number one. This is husband number two. This is the boyfriend you're living with right now. <laughs> right? For some people, this is when you were a girl. This is when you became a boy. And this is that season that you weren't sure what you were. You're just piling them on. The bags. You got bags. You got bags everywhere. You got bags under your eyes. You got bags everywhere. <laughs> Have you ever seen that person at the airport? And, and they're trying to save the $25 baggage fee. <laughs> so they're just going to carry everything on. Right? And, and, and our daughter, you know, is a flight attendant. So when she sees this person coming onto the airplane, she's like, oh, Lord. But it happens a lot, doesn't it? You've all seen it. This person shows up, and I feel for the, the, the women that travel alone sometimes, just because I feel like, man, that's a, a heavy load. They got the kids, and they got the bottles, and, and they're trying to get through TSA screening with the bottles, and the TSA is like, oh, no, you're going to blow the airplane up with this milk. You know, it won't be long that, like, if you're breastfeeding, they're going to be like, you got too much milk. You can't get on the airplane. You have to lose. You're going to have to lose a few ounces because that's dangerous. Breastfeeding on an airplane. You try to blow us up or what? I always feel for those moms. I'm like, ooh, I'm glad we dumped out that milk. I feel a lot safer now. But here you go through life, right? You wonder why you're tired. This is why you're tired. You got husband number one, number two, number three. You got boyfriends. You got kids. You got memories. You got regrets. You got issues. And you're keeping them all with you. And when I say let it go, you get mad at me. Right? You mad at me? Oh, I wish I could let it go. Oh, sure, pastor. Easy for you to say, let it go. Actually, you love all your baggage. You love all your baggage. You hang on to it. You rehearse your curse. Oh, yeah, you tell your friends. You know, my uncle, this is a true story. I'm not preaching now. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. My uncle, who's now passed away so I can talk about him, he got married more than 10 times. I don't know how many actual, but I know it was more than 10. And one day I asked him, I said, Uncle Jim, do you even remember all your wives' names? And he said, some of them, we didn't last very long. I said, some of them, none of them lasted very long. You got baggage, man. You got baggage. Can't even remember their names. And if you like your baggage, you hang on to it. You write it down. You tell your friends. You rehearse your curse. You know, when you're young, you can take a lot. You look good. Hair's good. Skin's good. You're doing fine. I'm fine. It's all fine. But then you hit 50, and you're carrying all this. 60, you're still carrying all this. 
you still remember. You know what I've been through in 1972? No, I don't want to know. I remember 1980, my third wife. Man, that's a bummer, bro. You old. And your bags are getting heavy. This is why you got headaches. This is why you got stomach aches. This is why you have back problems. Look at all this crap. No wonder. Jesus said, let it go. You, you got to get over it. You got to stop loving your bags. You got to let it go. Let it drop. You don't even care where. Just go. Let, let it drop. <laughs> Airport security can have that crap. <laughs> I'm just going to let it go. I'm, I'm going to be that guy that gets on the airplane. All I got is my phone. I don't even care. I'm going to start living life light, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty. Go to counseling, but set a date and say on September the 1st, on October the 1st, on December the 1st, before I leave 2021, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it drop. I am done with the drama and the trauma. You may not forget everything, but you now are building new memories. You're moving to a new place in life. You're focusing on new things, and you don't love your bags. You love your life. You love your spouse. You love your future. You're moving on, running the race with Jesus. Amen? Now, let me tell you some fun stories in the Bible about couples. We'll see how far we get. I don't have a lot of time, but I'll give you a few Bible couples and how their relationship could help ours. The first is kind of a funny couple. It's a man and his donkey. <laughs> However, the donkey is a girl, and you actually could switch it. It could be a girl and her donkey. So it's a couple. Numbers chapter 22. Remember, you can always go to the Christian faith church app, look under media, find the notes, and there's all these scriptures right there for you. Numbers 22, verse 21, Balaam, his name was Balaam, and he was a prophet. And these worldly kings from Moab came to Balaam and said, you need to curse Israel because we're going to fight them, but we can't fight them and win, so we need you to curse them. And, and Balaam was like, no, I can't curse Israel. By the way, church, the Bible said anyone who curses Israel will be cursed. So we see in the news now these different things going on around Israel. I don't understand all the politics. I don't want to, but I know that God has put his hand on Israel, and so I pray for Israel and I support Israel, and you'd be wise to do so. That doesn't mean we're against anybody. Else. We're for everybody coming to the Lord, knowing the blessing of the Lord. But don't get sideways with Israel, or you're going to find yourself having a heart attack and wonder what happened, because God said anybody who curses Israel will be cursed. Okay, so Balaam, he says, no, I can't curse him. Then the kings of Moab said, we will pay you. We're going to give you a lot of money. We're going to give you insurance. We're going to give you vacation time. You're going to have anything you want. And Balaam said, hmm, right? You knew the job wasn't right. You had to leave your family. You had to be on the road, maybe leave your church. But they offered you so much money. So many benefits. You knew it wasn't God's will, but you said, hmm, we can make so much. Balaam was attracted to the pay. So he saddled up his donkey and he packed up his stuff and off they go to the kings of Moab. In Numbers chapter 22 and verse 22, God's anger was aroused because he went. 
And the angel of the Lord took a stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey and his servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword in his hand. And the donkey turned around and went out into the field. Now, when your donkey sees what God is doing before you do, who really is the donkey here? Right? The donkey saw the angel of the Lord with his sword, and the donkey said, whoa, we're not going that way. Balaam didn't know what was going on. So Balaam struck the donkey with his staff. He's beating the one who carries him. Hey, guys, never beat the one who's helping you. That's like talking mean to the waitress at the restaurant. You want spit in your burger? You want who knows what on your salad? Be nice to the waitress. He struck his donkey. The angel of the Lord stood in the narrow path between the vineyards. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself up against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot, and he struck her again. He's abusing the one who carries him. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to go to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she laid down and Balaam struck her a third time. Husbands abusing their wives and the wife is the very one carrying their family. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. You know, if God has to get a donkey to talk, you need help, bro. <laughs> the Lord said to Balaam through the donkey, what have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? Balaam said to the donkey, okay, now, if you talk back to the donkey, again, I ask, who's the real donkey here? Because you've abused me, Balaam said. I wish I had a sword in my hand. I would kill you. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours and I've always been faithful to you? Man, this sounds like some marriages. Abusing one another, the very one that is the key to your success and the future of your blessing, and yet we're abusing each other. And then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword in his hand, and he bowed his head, and he fell flat on his face. And the Lord said, why have you struck your donkey? In other words, how often are we blaming those around us when in fact they're trying to save us? They're trying to help us. They're trying to keep us from the sword. They're trying to stop us from God dealing and, and, and they're praying for us and they're staying with us and we treat them with abuse. Oh, that God would open our eyes and we would see how God is trying to help us. Usually the one that you abuse is the very one that's the key to your blessing. You know, in the old King James Bible, it doesn't use the word donkey. It calls the donkey an ass. I, I wouldn't say that, but it is in the old King James. So maybe the message of this story is Stop being an ass. <laughs> or stop beating your ass. <laughs> or I thought about going with the title, Stop Talking Like an Ass. <laughs> okay, I don't know what all that means. Okay, here's another couple. 
Genesis chapter 3. The first married couple, Adam and Eve. And remember, when God created Adam, he then created Eve. He brought the two together. He presented Eve as his wife, not his girlfriend, not his hookup. He didn't say, live with her for a while, see if you like her. If you don't, I'll make another one. No. He brought the two together, husband and wife, and the two became one. And the next chapter, chapter 3, Eve starts listening to the serpent. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. The serpent was more subtle than any other beast in the field. And he said to the woman, has God said you should not eat from every tree in the garden? The serpent is sowing doubt, questioning God, questioning God's word. So you have those voices in your life, some of you. And, and it's a TV show, and it's a, a blog you read, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a post that you read, and it's a person that you follow, and the negative voice, the worldly voice, the ungodly voice is coming to you. Now, how long did the serpent talk to Eve? A week? A month? A year? I'll bet you Eve listened to the serpent for more than a year before she seriously considered what he said. Just letting that seed grow in her mind and in her heart. Just hearing those negative words, doubtful, negative, ungodly. Many people come to church, but they hear more from the serpent than they do from the Lord. They hear a few minutes from the Lord every week. Our service is what, an hour and 15 minutes. But they hear hours from the world every week. Hours from the serpent. And that negative seed is growing in their heart. And finally one day, the Bible says, Eve went to the tree of the knowledge, tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she ate the fruit and she gave to her husband who was with her. Catch that. Most of us think, you know, Adam was off riding giraffes or something when Eve was eating the fruit. No, the Bible said she ate the fruit and gave to her husband with her. Now, why didn't Adam stop it? Months before, weeks before, days before. Why didn't Adam grab the serpent and said, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm going to hold on to you until God shows up and we're going to ask God about this. Why didn't he do something? Why didn't he say, Eve, stop talking to the serpent. We're going with what God said. We don't care what that serpent says. The moral to the story, protect your spouse. Don't just condemn your spouse. Don't just be sarcastic toward your spouse. Don't just be mean to your spouse. Don't just say, you're so stupid. You're so dumb. Why'd you do that? Help them. Pray for them. Believe for them. Be there for them. Adam could have grabbed that serpent and just held him until God showed up and said, hey, God, this serpent here said that what you said is not true. What should I do with this guy? Ah, who knows what God would have done? Who knows how the story would have gone? But he let it happen, and Eve let it happen, and they forgot they were one. They were to fight together. They were to run the race together. They were to stand for each other. They were to be together. That's what God wants for every married couple. It's not always easy. Sometimes we don't make it easy for our spouse to stand up for us. But let's remember, you're a team. You need your spouse to win. So don't make it harder. Don't, don't be uh, resistant and rejecting and, and, and just talk to the hand because the face can't hear. No, you need to win. You need them to win. Work together, protect each other, believe for each other. Don't let the serpent crawl in your bedroom. Don't let the serpent move into your house. 
pray with each other, and win the race together. Now we're going to pray before we go. And I want to pray with you in your walk with God, in your relationship with God. I want to pray you're strong and that you are connecting with him. Let's close our eyes. Online friends, I need you to pray with me before we go. If you're not born again, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, if you don't pray with the Spirit, would you just lift up a hand and say, all right, Pastor, I need this prayer. I need something more in my relationship with God. If you're not sure where you are with God, let me see. Lift up a hand. I won't ask you to talk. I'm going to pray for you before we go. Who would say, yeah, I'm in. I'm in on this prayer. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Online friends, are you in? We're going to pray. We want to pray with you. You can put your hands down. Let's pray together. And church, be our prayer team. Let's all Pray it out loud. Today, Father, I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe he died for me and rose for me. Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit. I will pray with the spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.